Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's Coffee Microcaps Morning Meeting. My name is Mark Tobin. I am the founder of Coffee Microcaps for anybody who's joining us for the first time this morning. And for anybody who is one of our regular attendees or have attended one of our events in the past, you're very welcome back to this morning's session. I've got a quick couple of slides I'm just going to run through and then we're going to get straight into it with our presenter this morning. I'd like to make special mention of DMX Asset Management who are virtual event sponsors here at Coffee Microcaps. If you're looking for a smaller microcap fund manager, uh, please be sure to check out their website uh, for the relevant PDS or indeed reach out to Stephen or Michael on the email addresses and phone numbers below. Quick compliance and disclaimer slide. Uh, for anybody who is joining us for the first time, the companies we normally have presenting on here generally on a weekly or uh, fortnightly basis are capped under 300 million in market cap in revenue and approaching cash flow break even, or indeed like this morning's presenter are already profitable. Uh, outside the resources and biotech sectors generally, uh, what I like to call industrial microcaps, which covers um, technology, healthcare, industrial services, businesses, uh, financial services and uh, basically all those other sectors uh, outside resources and biotech. Uh, structured this morning's webinar we've got one presenter this morning normally we do have two on here um, but uh, we've got one this morning each company gets a 30 minute slot broken down into roughly a 20 minute preso and 10 minutes for Q&A. If you do have any questions for our presenters please type them in the Q&A box uh, rather than the chat function it just makes it easier for me to moderate the questions and please note the webinar is being recorded and it'll be on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel tomorrow morning where indeed you can access uh, over 100 other presentations that we've managed to clock up over the last uh, 18 months or so. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter, YouTube, as I said, you can subscribe there for all the content that we push out there, mainly the morning meetings, but we do have some microcap fund manager interviews on there from time to time, LinkedIn, and I write a free monthly microcap kind of focus newsletter that's on the Substack platform, and the next newsletter should be going out either Friday or Monday for November. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome back, it's been a long time between drinks, uh, Martin Pomeroy, the MD of Smart Pay Holdings. Uh, and with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Marty, if you want to start sharing yours, I'll let you know when I can see the, the slides on screen. No problems at all. Thank you, Mark. Just let me... Um... Yes, sir. You got that there, Mark? Uh, coming through now. Yeah, I can see the, the the slides now, Marty. You're good to go. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mark, um, for the introduction and the invite to attend another one of your morning briefings. Um, pleasure to be here. I, as, as introduced, I'm Martin Pomoy, um, CEO and Managing Director of SmartPay. This morning, I, I thought I would um, provide a, a quick, um, um, if you like, roadshow presentation that we've been using for our 2023 half-year results. Um, which were out uh, Monday this week. So um, I think it's probably a timely um, and, and constructive update uh, since the last time we spoke. In today's presentation, I'll cover performance highlights for the first half of the 2023 financial year. So our financial year is 1 April to 30 March. Um, so the first half finishing at the end of September just passed. I'll also then cover off um, some brief financial highlights and then just provide a quick update on um, our strategy, um, what we're currently engaged in, and uh, then welcome any questions at the end of the presentation. So I guess the first half can best be described as uh, an acceleration of our execution plan into our Australian market opportunity. Uh, we are committed to taking a meaningful share of the Australian small to medium enterprise enterprise in-store payments market. And I think our strong performance towards our goal in the first six months of FY23 is very pleasing. We've uh, continued to invest in marketing, sales and support functions with the goal of unlocking accelerated growth into the Australian, Australian SME market opportunity and have shown very, uh, as I say, pleasing performance and outcomes in the first half. Just as a bit of a recap, late in 
financial year 22, so sort of the January to March period this year, we back, began investing in both TV advertising into the Australian market and also into uh, in, in outbound business development capability and outbound sales, phone-based sales team competency and capacity um, in our directly in our Australian business. And whilst we saw some initial benefit from both of those investment streams in Q4 FY22, we were really testing to ensure that it, we, we could validate the investment case in terms of scaling into our opportunity. I guess the key point I would make about the first half is we are seeing the immediate return on investment of that um, into that activity. Um, and we have accelerated our customer acquisition into the Australian market in the first half. Broadly speaking, with the continuing momentum off the back of that investment in the first half and the annuity effect of the revenues um, and, and performance that we generate, we look forward to a very strong second half performance. As I said, as we continue to get, deliver against our strategic plan, we've seen a large increase in revenue half on half with 35.4 million consolidated revenue in two, first half 2023 reflecting a 68% increase on the same period last year. As mentioned earlier, we're continuing to invest in core areas to support our growth and have determined to do this in a measured way, ensuring we leverage our well-tuned operating structure. This is reflected in strong improvement in EBITDA and an increase year on year of over 115% to 8.1 million. We've also delivered another period of profit before tax confirming our resolve to grow rapidly on a profitable basis. Net profit before tax for the period is up 637% to close to 2.7 million. We've also delivered another period of positive cash flow generation, which has allowed for the purchase of increasing numbers of payment devices to support our accelerated customer acquisition. The ongoing investment in software development of both our payment solutions and enterprise solutions, and also allowed for further reduction in debt. Operating cash flow for the period was $10.1 million and up 130% from the prior period. We have seen ongoing resonance in market with our SME payment solution and through both direct and indirect marketing and sales execution have grown our transacting terminal fleet by close to 30% in the first half of the 23 financial year when compared to the fleet size at the end of FY22. We see this customer acquisition cadence as sustainable at a minimum. Off the back of our increased customer acquisition and reflecting the annuity nature of our revenues, as I mentioned earlier, acquiring revenue has increased close on 45% compared to the same period last year and contributed 26.9 million to our overall revenues for the first half 23, financial year 23. Further reflecting the relatively rapid revenue realisation we achieved from our customer acquisition results, run rate and monthly acquiring revenue in, in, in the Australian business in September was 5.5 million per month, compared to 3.7 million at the end of March 2022. With the growth in our Australian transacting terminal base and the stable and loyal nature of our New Zealand terminal fleet, our total terminal network across Australia and New Zealand now stands at over 43,000 devices installed in SME customers. The combination of accelerating our customer acquisition, focusing on cust target customer segments, and maintaining a close discipline to our unit economics is reflected in the correlation between an increase in transacting terminals, acquiring transactions processed, and ultimately acquiring transactional revenue, as can be seen in these graphs. The ongoing effect of the majority of customer acquisition being with our higher value smart charge proposition is continuing to drive our fleet profile of smart charge versus fixed rate customers to close to 80%, which further improves our average revenue per unit. I'll now briefly cover off some key financial highlights from the first half. As can be seen, our half-on-half -half revenue performance is showing um, very strong improvement um, and reflects the ongoing acceleration in the growth we are seeing into our Australian opportunity. We are committed to leveraging our extraordinary operating capacity and capability, and EBITDA is, 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 is realising 
ongoing growth as well as we scale our revenues. We are committed to strong growth whilst delivering ongoing profitability in the business. And you can see through uh, net profit before tax adjusted for the convertible note instruments that we held up until a year and a half ago, until the last financial year, you can see that underlying net profit before tax is on the improve also. And, and as mentioned earlier, we have strong operating cash flows and positive operating cash flows, and that can be seen as well through the period. Our execution plan is remarkably simple, and this in effect translates into a well-aligned management team and broader group of people within our organisation, all executing towards clear objectives. The majority of our investment continues to be focused into marketing content, advertising channels, and building internal IP and capacity along with the ongoing growth of our internal sales teams. Headcount in the Australian business has grown by six in the first six months of the year. We have also invested an additional engineering resource in the period to support our technology ambitions, and a number of support functions have also been added to ensure we scale, as we scale, we maintain our market-leading customer experience. For us, a key point of difference for our business in the bank-dominated market. This investment has seen a 30% improvement in our total market share in the first six months of FY23, a very strong and pleasing result. Whilst delivering exceptional execution is a big part of our story, we're also very much focused on the future. We continue to embed our recently implemented ERP, and this continues to provide the business with improving business efficiency, strategic scaling optionality, and we expect also digital customer experience benefit over time. Our next generation Android terminal platform development is well underway and will be delivered to both our New Zealand and Australian customers in 2023. We continue to ensure our other technology platforms remain modern and enhanced with ongoing improvements to the hub, which is our online customer portal, further integrations to Smart Connect, our cloud-based POS integration platform, and further engineering effort of our acquiring platforms, ensuring we can rapidly scale into our opportunity. Our investment in TV advertising and the growing number of customer referral opportunities we are realizing reinforces the value, both near term and strategically, of investing in our brand, and we will continue to invest in this area moving forward. Of course, we remain open and agile to new opportunities that may emerge, to further enhance our customer offering or increase the cadence of our growth. As we grow into the Australian market opportunity and ultimately scale the business performance and results, we are mindful that the maturity and profile of the business also needs to scale. We are increasing our focus on ESG to ensure we are well prepared to meet the changing expectations of the market, our shareholders and other stakeholders. We are increasing our focus on ESG to ensure we are well prepared to meet the changing expectations of the market, our shareholders and other stakeholders. We will replace our small fleet of service vehicles as leases come due to hybrid technology. We have been committed for some time to ensuring the least environmentally impactful disposal of our redundant payment hardware and are proud to state that 100% of our end of life equipment is sent for recycling. Whilst we have an incredibly diverse workforce, we continue to focus on other aspects of diversity and other initiatives as key part of our point of difference. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you again for the invite, Mark, and I'd now welcome any questions. Uh, thanks, Marty. Yeah, we've got a couple that have uh, come in already. Uh, one, and uh, you've kind of referenced it, but maybe we dive a little deeper on it. Um, Employee and IT compliance costs rose significantly in the last half, 45 and 55 percent, respective half and half. So that you know crunched margins a little bit. Um, how will these costs trend in the future? Is it is the last half kind of upfront costs that are going to normalize, or do you kind of expect uh, as as we've kind of this reopening period continues over the next 12 or 18 months for for those costs to kind of scale uh, as you grow? I think the, um, the 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 first answer is probably the one to run with with some nominal increase. Um, and so so one of the things that I would call out is that 
Um, we we actually engage, employed a, a business development manager and an outbound sales sort of manager and, and, and sort of started to build out that team late in Q4, Mark. Um, and so when you look sort of second half versus second half 22 versus first half 23, there would have been a small amount of sort of headcount effect in that last quarter. But of course, we've now had the full six month run rate of the scale of that team and those roles. So the reality is, is that we probably started the financial year at a at an upticked run rate in terms of that headcount. Um, we will not have the same increment from the first half to the second half. It, it, it'll be much more sort of run rate on that basis as opposed to, you know, a further scaling up and a scaling out of that at the same sort of cadence, if you like, um, from, from, from sort of second half last year to first half this year. I think that answers that question. Is that correct, Mark? Would, would that be your view? Uh, yeah. Um, and then we've kind of got two that are linked together on um, the increasing revenue per terminal. Um, is, you know, is that a case of uh, the customers you're bringing on now just have, uh, you know, higher transaction volumes or, or higher average ticket sizes? Um, or is it, you know, this kind of slow move away from from cash, although it's majority done pretty much in Australia and New Zealand, or it, it's still uh, it's still part of the the kind of digitization of, of financial services. Yeah, look, there's a few drivers in there and you, there's probably all of the ones you've mentioned. I mean, if you think of that sort of cash transition to card, that's fairly glacial. You know, you would you would probably see that impact over years rather than months if you if you follow it's it's uh you know it, it i think there's still further you know transition to go but as i say my, my view on that in terms of the impact is probably more glacial than 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 noticeable i think that you know there are a couple of key drivers of that outcome for us and what you're seeing there so so one is that um we we have a we have two core acquiring products in essence one is called a flat rate product whereby the merchant pays a fixed rate um, as a percentage of their sales for all of the cards they accept. We have another product which is called Smart Charge where the, 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 the rate um, um, or the percentage that is charged for accepting cards is passed on to the consumer on a transaction by transaction basis. And that is the solution that um, is really resonating, I guess, with our target opportunity. And, and, and so the majority of sales and customers that we onboard on a monthly basis are choosing that product. That product has a higher revenue profile than the flat rate product. And one of the dynamics in our fleet is that our first foray into the Australian market when we launched was with the flat rate product. So the, the proportion of customers that are on our higher revenue product that we take on each month is, is the proportion of those customers is higher than the profile of that product across our existing fleet. And so over time, our average revenue per unit goes up because of that impact or that effect and, and that driver. So it's sort of close to 80% of our fleet now in Australia is on, is on that smart charge solution. But we are still, you know, relatively speaking, taking on a higher percentage of new customers than that monthly on that product. So that, that, that we suspect will continue for a wee while yet. It, it looks like a systemic type of a driver for that increase in average revenue. It, it's affected by the bringing on of those, of those, um, of, of that, you know, the majority of customers on that product. The second driver is we are becoming a bit more targeted in terms of the, um, the, the specific verticals, if you like, or customer demographics um, into the, the sort of target opportunity we're focusing on in Australia. And so we, we, we're not only, uh, you know, getting the majority of customers on our higher value product, we're also seeking out what you could describe as probably higher value customers. And so that will be having an effect as well. I guess the third piece is I talked about sort of growing our Australian fleet by circa 30% in this first half alone. And so the, the relative effect of that plus that higher vet, uh, the higher um, um, revenue product being the majority of the sales we're doing kind of has a bit of a multiple effect on that as well. So those are probably the three key things I'd call out. The, the final thing would be there is a bit of forex 
Jackson there in the first half as well. There's been some um, sort of Aussie dollar, New Zealand dollar movement in the in the first half. We we sort of collect in Aussie dollars and report in New Zealand dollars. So there's a slight effect from that as well. But those underlying elements that I've talked about are the drivers that we've not only seen in the first half of this year, but we've seen over the last few years in terms of in terms of drivers towards that outcome. Uh, and another question that might, might be linked to, to your last answer, Marty, is um, direct transaction costs have decreased as a percentage of revenue. Is this a result of fee changes from, from Cuscal giving the increase in volumes or, or, or is it uh, something else? It, it, look, we've talked before about, you know, and so that was decreased, you said, wasn't it? Sorry, Mark. Are you there? Sorry, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, we just lost you there for I a just second. Wanted to, I just wanted to make sure that I captured your question correctly. You said there's been some, was it fee um, decrease? The question uh, is uh, direct transaction costs have just decreased as a percentage of revenue. Is this a result of fee changes from Cuscal giving increasing volumes? It, it, yeah. To some degree, yes. So there are a few drivers in there, but uh, but but we called out. I think at the end of the financial year last year that you know we we've structured our business so that as we grow, we can take advantage of the volume, the increasing volume that we deliver to certain partners. Cusco is one of them, and and so as a as a as a byproduct of that growth and that increasing volume we expect to get sort of tearing benefits and, and those sorts of things, as you would in, in, in a business of our nature, um, um, volume benefit and tearing. And so um, as we've grown, we've started to take advantage of some of those sorts of things. So um, that, that's what you're seeing there largely. Okay. Uh, the next one, uh, what is the practical significance of the Android terminal development? So yeah, maybe just flesh out um, what the, the end game is there. Yeah, no problems at all. It's a great question. Um, so the the reality of, of, of the space that we participate in, which is the sort of physical in-store payment space, is that it's subject to a compliance regime. Um, in essence, to protect everyone that's involved in it, the merchant, the card holder, um, and, and ourselves as the acquirer and 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 you know the banks and and the processes etc and and that compliance regime for us means that on on sort of a a six seven year basis we need to ensure that the terminal fleet we have is is meeting the most up to date compliance requirements and so we will regularly um, or fairly regularly be you know sort of releasing new versions of terminals to ensure that our ter uh, that our fleet is, is most compliant and most up to date. Now, often um, merchants and, and others won't see the difference. It'll be the same unit, but it'll have another layer of protection built into it and therefore be sort of issued a, a, a more recent a PCI grading, which is the compliance regime we're in. A Android, the Android terminal development, the Android terminal is partly to deliver against that ongoing commitment and obligation to make sure that we have the latest um, um, sort of compliance version of Terminal. But the reason that Android is, is, is sort of more than that for us and the reason that, that, that we're sort of calling out the fact that our next version will be Android is because actually Android is a different operating system for payments. Um, um, if you know about Android, it allows for multiple applications to run on a device at the one time. The, the operating system on most of the terminals we have now and, and most of the terminals that are in market globally historically is they do one thing very well and that is take a card payment, encrypt it and then and then send that to a processor and receive a message back. So they're sort of a, a one trick pony as it were, Mark. So what Android allows us to do is not only deliver um, uh, the payment application experience and ensure that we can still manage and handle any card type that might turn up. It also allows us an operating system foundation to develop other solutions um, and deliver other value add opportunities to our customer base. And, and what's exciting about that for us, I guess, with a fleet of sort of 43, 44,000 terminals and, and, and rapidly growing across Australia and New Zealand, is that we will have a common um, software platform for that, if you like, or a common operating system platform for that, 
um, across that network. Um, so in terms of scalability for other solutions and, and, and sort of scalability for value add, it's a, it's a pretty exciting platform opportunity for us. Uh, we've just actually had one emailed in as well. Um, supply chain issues. Um, have you had any issues getting enough uh, terminals to satisfy demand given the, you know, the, the sharp increase you've seen? Uh, the the uh, question says that um, Ingenico seemingly had a problem getting a, enough terminals out to its customers uh, a couple of months back. So they're just wondering, have you encountered any supply chain issues in actually sourcing terminals? No, um, we haven't, just categorically. Um, I will I will talk a little bit more to that though. We, we, have, a, uh, we have a sort of 15 plus year relationship with, with a manufacturer out of China called PAX. Um, so we have a, you know, a long-standing um, partnership with a, a terminal provider, a direct manufacturer of terminals out of China. They would be, if not the largest uh, manufacturer and distributor of payment devices globally now, very close to that. They'd certainly be the second largest without a doubt. Um, and so we are dealing with a, with a, with a business with global scale um, um, you know, uh, um, production, capacity and capability to meet global demand. So from our perspective, we are with a very, um, I, I guess, um, um, well-structured and, and sizable provider. When, when the COVID restrictions initially um, um, came into effect a couple of years ago now, we made a determination as a business that we would actually um, um, lift the, I guess, volume of equipment that we ordered. What we'd been running on was a fairly lean stock principle or methodology where we knew that we could readily get the terminals we needed from our supplier with very strict timelines and so we would tend to run lean stock and and just order down as as we needed to we determined as a business that it would be prudent to actually extend that sort of outlook and extend that ordering time if you like and so we actually started to buy in larger quantities um, to buffer out any potential disruption to their manufacturing or any potential disruption that we might get with, you know, sort of um, sea freight or air freight from the distributor in China to us. So I think that approach served us very well through those sort of trading restriction periods and lockdown periods and where the real disruption was there. And, and we've maintained that approach now. By, by, by maintaining that approach, it's actually given us the volume of buffer stock that we have needed um, to actually fairly rapidly scale and continue to deliver the sort of the customer service level agreements and the delivery timeframes that we have. So we've seen uh, no impact in our ability and speed to market with the delivery of terminals to new customers. We, um, we have um, had no issues in terms of stock carrying levels and quantities um, and, and, and we're not seeing some of the um, challenges that you've mentioned that other suppliers are having. Um, there's always a touch wood element to that, Mark, because it's a it's a it's a it's a surprising world we we operate in these days. Um, you can't predict everything, but I think that the combination of dealing with the scale of supplier we have and partner we have, and how we had planned and um, changed our approach to sort of stock management, I think has served us very well and continues to do so. Um, and then I'm not sure if you disclose this in the segmentals of the accounts. Um, question around the, the gross margin of the Australian acquiring business. Look, I think that I, I, I think that it is possibly identifiable, but but I know that we have talked about it, so um, I'm happy to share that. It's sort of circa fifty to fifty five percent, sort of probably closer to the fifty five percent mark. It's an interesting call out. I'll make it just quickly because. Um, we, we, we often call out that that, that that margin is is on the improve for some of the other reasons that I've discussed earlier. But if you look on a consolidated basis, it looks like our consolidated margin is coming down. That's, that's related to the two different revenue types that we generate in the business. So in the New Zealand business, we generate a, a, a sort of a monthly fixed sort of subscription fee from the rental of a terminal. It's contracted over a term and, and it's a very stable sort of revenue line. And there are no real sort of um, material cogs associated to it. So the, the gross margin for that revenue line is probably close to 90%, if you like. The Australian 
um, um, revenue is a transactional based revenue. So it's so it has transactional based cogs associated to it. And that is obviously, as I say, circa 50, 55%. And so as we volume up that revenue in that model, it's bringing down the consolidated gross margin profile of the business, which I think from memory at the moment is circa sort of 60, 65%. So that gives a bit of a look through, I guess, or a bit of a description as to the narrative we provide on the Australian margin, but actually how the consolidated margin is, is sort of coming down due to that growth effect. Uh, we have one or two more, Marty, but I'm cognizant that we're, we're up on time. Have you got five more minutes to tackle a few more? Let's run at it, Mark. Let's go. Okay. Um, the key drivers to improving gross margin as the business scales? Gross margin or operating leverage? Uh, I think the yeah it says improving gross margin as the business scales, but uh, perhaps they mean operating leverage. Uh, the key drivers. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I think, I think, I think, like I say, gross margin is a function of you know sort of revenue from our um, terminals, and I think that as we said, to sort of all from our transactional volumes, I think you know average revenue will improve again over time. Um, um, that's that's what we would see from that effect of as I say, high proportion of higher value high revenue yielding sort of um, products in Australia versus the fixed rate. So, um, but, but, you know, we wouldn't sort of call out any guidance there or give any sort of clear indication on that. If we're talking about operating leverage over time, that's the common question I get. Look, we're taking an attitude at the moment of reinvesting in the business to further accelerate growth. I think that, um, you know, the first half of this year has really provided a direct look through for all stakeholders to um, where we're spending our money and the fairly immediate effect of 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 you know that that investment and and we see I certainly see and I'm driving the business towards further acceleration and 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 you know getting more of that market share that's available to us more rapidly so we will continue to um, invest in a measured way to further. Um, um, you know, acquire market share uh, in the Australian context. I think that um, ultimately the, the view I have around sort of operating leverage is that oh, I expect certainly for this year um, that the ratio of EBITDA to revenue would be consistent at the very least with last year. So FY22, I think that I, 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 we, we then are putting together our sales and execute, marketing execution plans for next year at present and 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 I would expect that the team is driven to, you know, further improve our customer acquisition cadence, et cetera. So that's my expectation. Ultimately, over time, as we sort of, you know, given the annuity nature of our revenues, over time, I expect that our operating leverage starts to grow out compared to um, revenue. It's the nature of the business. Um, you know, we will, we, we, we grow in a measured way. We don't throw, you know, money, um, um, you know, unlimited money at customer acquisition. So ultimately, your operating leverage will grow out over time, undoubtedly, in my view. The, the final piece I will say also is I can see absolutely no argument and no reason why we wouldn't maintain and continue to see the growth we're seeing on, on, on also, but whilst maintaining a profitable business. Um, I don't believe that um, there is any reason to sacrifice profitability um, or strong operating leverage as we continue to grow at a very strong rate. Okay, we've got two more, Marty, and then we're, we're going to let you go. Um, go smart pay terminal impairments have fallen quite a bit over the last 18 months. Is this a function of the current trading environment or something to do with a change to the transaction acquiring income? Geez, that's a good question. I think, you know, technically, I'd probably almost prefer for my CFO to answer that question. So if you'd like to maybe post that one to me with an email, I can get the, you know, sort of accurate commentary back on that one. Okay, no worries. We'll take that one offline. And then the other one is just around uh, a, a bit of a macro picture. And um, the question says, you know, on the one hand, you've got positive macro trends for the business of, you know, COVID-19 reopening, you know, events, festivals, domestic and international tourism, you know, normalizing or actually, you know, pent up demand being realized versus 
increasing interest rates to kind of cool the economy and cool inflation and the the person is wondering you know which one is kind of winning out uh in terms of the volumes you are seeing coming through the through the network at present it's a it's a great question it sounds like we've almost got an economist on the line with us um it's a great question mark i i think um look let's 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 wait and see if you look at the first six months of the year you'd suggest that there's still a fairly strong level of consumer confidence and consumerism out there um we're massively mindful of you know the macro effects and what impact they might have on the business so i think from our perspective we've got a rapid growth rate um and so you know with we don't have sort of like a static revenue line by any stretch of the imagination we have a rapidly growing revenue line due to the sort of customer acquisition that we're achieving into the Australian opportunity. And so I think that, you know, from, from our perspective and, and through some of those macroeconomic things that you talked about in terms of COVID trading effects and, and you know, um, um, businesses now starting to sort of reopen and, and, and well, actually they have done now for, for some time, but, you know, sort of some of those things, I think that, that our product and proposition of market really resonates with that. So actually, you know, some of those things are probably having a positive marketing effect for us, if anything, and 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 uh, assisting us with our rapid customer acquisition. In terms of broadly speaking, whether, you know, inflationary pressures or interest rate lifts and those sorts of things ultimately have a, an impact on consumer spending and, and, and what people pe what people spend and when. Um, um, I, look, I'm, I'm not an economist. I, I don't know you know, ultimately where that'll end up and what ultimate effect that'll have. But I suspect that given that we're growing fairly rapidly and some of those drivers are the reasons that customers come to us, I suspect that we will still deliver, you know, sort of positive ongoing revenue growth and um, and, and then and then we'll feel the effects of any of those sort of, um, you know, business by business consumer spending effects the same as any other business would. We won't be immune to the, you know, to the to the other sort of broader macroeconomic effects that that others that others you know um, um, will get. So I, th I think that's probably the commentary I'd want to make on it. Okay, no worries, Marty. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, it was good to have you back in again, and uh, appreciate uh, taking the few extra minutes to. Uh, to cover off the last couple of questions, I know we have gone about nearly 10 minutes over time, so uh, we let you go and grab some lunch there in Auckland, and uh, I will thank everyone for joining the call this morning. Thank you very much, Mark. Pleasure to be with you again, and um, keep safe, go well. Thank you very much.